Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our roundtable on high deductible health plans. I'm Kim Zubarek, Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Cancer Policy Institute, which is the policy and advocacy arm of the cancer support community. This roundtable is part of CSC's Forum on Utilization Management. Now in its fourth year, the forum was created to foster thoughtful discussions that engage a broad range of healthcare stakeholders and keep the focus on patients. Ask tough and nuanced questions about when various UN approaches are acceptable and when they have the potential to harm patient health outcomes, as well as identify new ideas and promising practices that optimize evidence-based healthcare. CSC is committed to fostering conversations that inform and engage all stakeholders in the creation and implementation of UN strategies that include the patient perspective and incentivize cost efficiency through improved patient care and outcomes. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. If you have any technical or administrative difficulties, please let us know by using the chat box at the bottom of the screen and we'll do our best to address them. We will be recording today's roundtable to allow those who cannot join us listen to the presentations and discussions at a later date. We'll have a question and answer session at the end of the speaker presentations. Please submit questions into the Q&A box throughout the presentations and we'll do our best to get to them during today's Q&A session. I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Amgen, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, GSK, Janssen, Merck, Novartis, Pfizer, and Sanofi. Whether you are a patient, caregiver, patient advocate, payer, an employer, or with industry, we are all here today because we believe we have a role to play in making healthcare accessible, affordable, and of high quality. We are honored to be joined today by three great speakers to offer their various perspectives on high deductible health plans. I'd like to start today's roundtable by introducing our first speaker, Cynthia Cox. Cynthia is Vice President at Kaiser Family Foundation and Director for the Program on the ACA, where she conducts economic and policy research on the Affordable Care Act and its effects on private insurers and enrollees. Her work focuses on enrollment, pricing, and competition in the ACA's exchange markets. Cynthia also directs the Peterson Kaiser Health System Tracker, a partnership of the Peterson Center on Healthcare and KFF, aimed at monitoring the performance of the US health system over time and in relation to other large high income countries. Her work on this project focuses on trends in healthcare costs, access and affordability, as well as measures of healthcare quality and outcomes. Prior to joining KFF, Cynthia held research and advocacy positions at Columbia University Medical Center and the American Cancer Society. She also served on the board of directors of the Berkeley Free Clinic. Cynthia holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of California at Berkeley and a Master of Public Health degree from Columbia University. Welcome, Cynthia, and I'll turn it over to you. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So I'm Cynthia, I'm gonna be talking about like some background on how deductibles have risen and also the thinking behind why deductibles exist. Um, just one quick caveat, I work at Kaiser Family Foundation. It's not affiliated with Kaiser Permanente. We're an independent nonprofit research organization. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, deductibles have been becoming more common in private insurance over time. And for people who do have a deductible, the average amount of that deductible has also risen. So employers and insurers are using deductibles as a way to lower monthly premiums. The idea behind a deductible is not just to shift costs to employees or enrollees. Um, it's also to get people to think twice about whether they need to use healthcare or what kind of healthcare they use. So health insurance premiums go up when the total healthcare costs are going up and total healthcare costs go up um, when there's more healthcare that's being used and or when there's higher prices paid for that healthcare. So if I have a deductible, um, in theory at least, I might think twice about whether I need to go to the doctor in the first place and also I might look around for a lower cost doctor since I would be exposed to that whole price. 
or for prescription drugs, I might think, do I need to use this prescription drug? And if so, is there a generic alternative to the brand name drug? So that's how deductibles are supposed to work in theory. But of course, if deductibles get too high to the point that people cannot afford their care, then that can mean that they miss or delay that is needed. Um, also, I should say, you know, employers are, are thinking about themselves here to some degree. Employers are an important part of the story. A lot of people think about insurers as being the ones to raise deductibles, but employers are really the ones that are picking health plans too. And employers are the ones paying the large share of the premium. And so, you know, they're in it's in their interest to have a higher deductible plan if that means that they can save money on the premium. Employers are also thinking about um, that their average or typical employee is going to be pretty healthy just because most of us are healthy at any given point in our lives. Um, but when someone gets sick or has a chronic illness or a serious injury, then uh, they can be on the hook for costs that they cannot afford. Um, so just since 2006, deductibles used to be, for people who had a deductible, it was a little over $500 in 2006. That's like $800 today. And now deductibles have more than doubled, even accounting for inflation. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you can see that um, also about a third of workers have a deductible over $2,000. And that's almost half of workers in small firms that have a deductible over $2,000. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is showing what people are actually paying out of pocket. So not just looking, a deductible amount is how much someone might have the potential to spend out of pocket, um, but this is looking at um, what people are act actually spending. So here you can see that people are actually spending a little bit less on co-pays. That's because insurance companies and employers are using co-pays less often, and they're shifting towards using deductibles or co-insurance. Co-insurance is a, is a percentage of the total bill. Um, so both co-insurance and deductibles expose enrollees to the underlying price of healthcare more, um, whereas a co-pay is just a fixed dollar amount. So over time, both coinsurance and deductible payments have risen faster than inflation. If you go to the next slide, um, it's also true that when you combine all out-of-pocket spending on what employers, what employees are paying towards their premium, what they're paying towards their deductible, their co-payments, their coinsurance, all of that together is also rising faster than what the employer is paying towards the premium and faster than how much workers' wages are growing on average. So this is causing affordability problems because people are having to pay more even though they're not getting paid more. Uh, going to the next slide. So just switching gears really quickly to the ACA plans, um, just to, you know, as I think most of you may know, you know, relatively few people are actually enrolled in the ACA marketplaces. Most people with private insurance are in employer-based coverage. Um, but I wanna make a quick point that uh, deductibles can be very high on the ACA marketplaces. Um, a bronze plan, which a lot of people who don't get a subsidy might be buying, um, are the deductibles there are about $7,000. Um, but they can be much lower too, depending on which uh, type of plan a person buys. And going to the next slide, um, the really important point in considering the ACA deductibles is that they're really different from employer deductibles. With an employer plan, really the lowest income employee is probably gonna have the same health plan, choice of health plans or deductibles that a higher income employee at the same company is gonna have. So lower income people with employer coverage end up spending a larger share of their income on their healthcare costs. But on the ACA marketplaces, there are kind of additional ways of helping lower income enrollees where, you know, someone who's making just above the poverty level would only have a deductible of about 100 or $200, whereas somebody who's higher income would have a deductible in the thousands of dollars. Okay, going to the next slide. And so here we're gonna you know, transition back to employer-based coverage again, um, but really this is also kind of true across the board. When you have a deductible, um, that means that you're having to pay oftentimes a large amount upfront 
before your health insurance kicks in. And so what that means is that deductible spending often happens, is concentrated towards the beginning of the year. So this time of year in January, February, March is when people tend to be spending a lot of money towards their deductible before their insurance kicks in later in the year. And so what that can mean is that if you don't have a lot of savings, then the deductible, even if you paid, let's say hypothetically, if you paid the same amount out of pocket through co-payments versus paying it through a deductible, the, the deductible can still cause more affordability problems because you're having to tap into your savings at the beginning of the year, whereas a copay is spread out over the course of the year. Um, so going to the next slide, this is um, kind of a concept that we made up. This, um, this is this idea of deductible relief day, which is basically means like, at what day do most people reach their deductible? Um, and you know, a lot of people never reach their deductible, but back in 2006, when deductibles were lower or less common, you know, people might have reached their deductible early in the year in February. But now the deductibles are becoming more common and are rising, people aren't actually going to meet their deductible until the middle of the year, maybe even never. And so that means that they're having to pay out of pocket throughout the year before they really see the value of their health insurance. Uh, going to the next slide. And so I'm just going to show a few slides. These are really kind of examples. The point here is that when you have a serious or chronic illness, you spend more out of pocket. So this is a chart showing people who have cancer diagnoses. Um, they, about half of people with several cancer diagnoses pay more than $2,000 out of pocket each year. Some people pay way more than $2,000 out of pocket each year. Uh, going to the next slide, um, this is, you know, same concept. People with diabetes or immune disorders also are paying a lot of money each year. Um, and then going to the next slide, you might be sensing a theme here. This is looking, you know, not, not just at physical health, but also mental health. Um, people with serious mental illness also spend a lot of money each year out of pocket. Uh, so going to the next slide, this is just the last slide here. And I just want to wrap up that, you know, $2,000 is a lot of money to most people. That is um, really the typical amount of savings that people have is about, you know, a little more than $2,000 if you are a single person. And if you are having to pay um, out of pocket about $2,000 a year, um, you're quickly going to drain your savings. And that means that you don't have money for other unexpected expenses that might come up, like, um, you know, your car needs to get fixed, or you need to call the plumber or the electrician. And so, you know, these, these high healthcare costs are eating away at household budgets too, over time. And um, just wrapping up on the last slide, you know, it, it kind of to pull it all together, you know, deductibles are meant to give people skin in the game or to make them think twice about using healthcare. But if you have a chronic or a serious illness, you are almost guaranteed to surpass your deductible each year. So you know, a lot of healthcare spending or a lot of what drives health insurance premiums are the sickest enrollees. You know, half of healthcare spending is concentrated in the sickest or, or most expensive is another way of thinking about it, 5% of people. So the sickest people are the ones contributing most to health spending, which makes sense. You know, they're the ones who need the most health care, but they're guaranteed to blow through their deductible each year. So do they really have an incentive to shop around or is this just a way of guaranteeing that they're going to drain their savings? Um, so many people lack the liquid assets or the savings to pay these high costs. And on top of that, chronically ill or disabled people might also be experiencing a loss in employment or income, um, you know, other kinds of disruptions to their income because of their illness. So what this means is that sicker people are on the hook for higher medical bills that they often cannot afford. And so what we see on average is that people who are in worse health report more cost-related access barriers to care. That means they're more likely to delay or forego needed medical care because of the cost associated with it. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to the next person. Thank you so much, Cynthia, uh, for that very helpful overview.
of high deductible health plans. Our next speaker is Myra Simon, principal at Avalier Health. Myra provides strategic insight to health plans, providers, drug manufacturers, and advocacy organizations to help them understand existing federal health care policy, identify how policy proposals impact their businesses, and develop advocacy plans. She applies over 20 years of experience working with health plans to help clients navigate the Affordable Care Act and emerging health reform proposals. Myra has expertise in commercial insurance product lines, improving access to comprehensive coverage, benefit design, health plan operations, and strategic planning. Prior to joining Avalier, Myra worked at the Trade Association America's Health Insurance Plans, assisting health plans develop and advocate for policies to increase coverage affordability and improve the consumer experience. Before that, she worked in a variety of roles at Cambia Health Solutions. Thanks for joining us today, Myra. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for having me today. So um, what I'm going to do, folks, is sort of talk through in a little bit more detail the rationale for high deductible health plans. And then I'm going to talk about some considerations for a patient who does have a serious health condition if they do end up on a high deductible health plan. So first, circling back to Cynthia's points on like, why were these created? Why do they exist? The original thinking was to make people more sensitive about healthcare costs. So the idea was not just that premiums would go down because the patients were covering more of their own out-of-pocket costs. The original idea was patients would shop and they would choose the, the less expensive place to get the MRI. So the total cost of care would go down, which then would be reflected in premiums and out-of-pocket costs. So I think what we can say for sure is that costs moved from the premiums to the cost sharing. If this is the cost sharing and this is the premiums, um, high deductible moves more into the cost sharing. To this point about does the shopping actually get the total cost of care down? Um, at this point, I would say we don't have really compelling evidence uh, that people are aggressively shopping and that total cost of care is coming down because of the growth of in deductibles. And Cynthia made some good points about if you have a serious health condition, I would say even if you are in a maintenance mode as a cancer survivor, the ongoing monitoring that you do might mean that you're always going to um, you know, spend your deductible anyway, and that the incentive to shop around for the, the most cost-effective MRI may not be there if you know you need to hit the deductible anyway. Um, in the conceiving of these products, there was a, you know, an attempt to create incentives for the people enrolled on them where it would be a good option also for the enrollee. So the incentive that exists there is that the money spent on the deductible can be with before tax dollars. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about like what that looks like um, and why for some people that would be an incentive. So um, there's a few different ways that you can use pre-tax pre money for those deductibles. One is through an FSA, flexible spending account through your employer. One is if the employer provides a health reimbursement account um, called an HRA. And then the third, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more is that the plan, the high deductible plan allows a person to open what's called a health savings account. And the health savings account option would be the one that's available to people shopping on the individual market, um, as well as some employers would choose the version where they offer an HSA. So what this would mean is that the person who's, who's enrolled on the qualified high deductible health plan can open a bank account where they can defer pre-tax money from their check into that bank account and then use that bank account to pay for that deductible and other costs. Um, employers also can make contributions to those accounts. So that would be more money the employer could give to help the arrangement work better for the, the patient. I will say that um, Kaiser Family Foundation, Cynthia's organization, put out some statistics recently around how, what kind of contributions are employers making to those accounts. And for the HSA qualified high deductible health plan, the average was under $600. So you know we saw the numbers for the deductibles. So does $600 average contribution from the employer make up for that high deductible? Probably not. It probably still leaves the enrollee in a position of having a big expenditure at the beginning of the year. So the other thing I will tell you about the HSAs is that the pre-tax money that goes in there uh, can sit in there, it can be invested, 
And then at retirement, it can be taken out for other purposes. So for people who don't ever use healthcare, this can be a way to put more money away pre-tax for retirement. If you know that you're gonna use it all during the, during the plan year, then um, that incentive really isn't there for you. Um, I will also mention that for people who have uh, HSA qualified high deductible health plans, only one out of three even open an account. So while you can do this, this account with these tax advantages with the high deductible health plan, one, th one out of three people don't even open the account. Then of people who open the account, many don't, e don't make contributions. And we understand the financial pressures people are under. I think Colette will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And so lots of folks aren't, don't have enough um, flexible income to defer it to this account to save the tax money. So all of that was just to set the stage a little bit about what's the backdrop behind this. I think it reinforces Cynthia's points that whether or not these are attractive options for people with serious health conditions is a really different question than whether it might be an attractive option for someone who doesn't expect to use much health care during the year. And um, Colette will talk in a minute about when you're choosing a plan, how you make that choice and put a little bit more color on um, you know, how those choices are made by people who know that they need a medication or know that they need follow-up cancer care, even if they're doing great. Um, but so what I'm going to pivot to now is if you do find yourself on one of those plans or a friend or a loved one um, who has a serious health condition, um, what are some things that can sort of help you navigate that plan? So the first thing I'll say is that if you can manage it at all, funding one of those tax advantaged accounts will um, sort of reduce the amount of your own money that you end up spending on this. So, you know, if you put $2,000 in that account and you would have spent uh, like $700 of that would have gone to taxes if you hadn't put it in the account, then it's more like you're spending $1,300 you would have gotten in your paycheck instead of the 2,000. That's really rough math. So if you, if you do have one of these plans, um, it's really worth it to look at your finances and see if you can do the FSA or the HRA or the HSA, whichever one um, your plan qualifies for. Uh, the other thing I will mention is that, you know, this does require financial planning for January. Um, Cynthia talked about the deductible day. If you know you have a serious health condition, then you may know that you're going to incur those costs in January or February. One thing I will flag is that it's always worth it to ask doctors or hospitals about payment plans. Um, once the bill hits the insurance system, you're going to get credited for your deductible spending. So whatever arrangement you work out with your provider to actually get that bill completely paid is not going to keep that money from showing up on your deductible. Um, so it's worth it if you are strapped financially to talk to the provider about whether they would accept a payment plan. And I would also flag here that uh, if you have choices besides using credit cards, you should definitely consider those because once you put the the cost on a credit card, it's now uh, the kind of debt that's treated as regular credit card debt and you have whatever interest rates you would have with your credit card. Um, if it can stay with your provider in the form of a payment plan, you may have lower or no interest. And medical debt has some slightly different treatment under laws around credit ratings and um, collections and those kinds of things where you might have some extra advantages if you find yourself unable to pay the bill if the debt has stayed with the provider. Now, obviously, um, the big picture goal is to prevent being in that position. I'm trying to give some practical information that can be helpful if folks are in that position. But I think when Colette talks in a minute about choosing a plan, if you can choose a plan that's not going to put you in a position where you're choosing between credit card debt or a payment plan, that obviously it would be preferable not to be in that position. Um, the last thing that I would like to flag is to talk about uh, preventive care coverage requirements. And I think it's important for folks to be aware of this because the Affordable Care Act requires most employer plans to cover screenings like mammograms, colonoscopies before the deductible. So for somebody who's already in tr active treatment for a serious condition or a survivor of a serious condition, um, that may not you know, change the landscape a lot. But if you have a spouse, children, siblings who are on a high deductible health plan, 
and you learn through experience that you have breast cancer or colon cancer in the family, they can get those screenings um, without any cost sharing, even if they're on a high deductible health plan. And so I think as folks who have had these experiences might be called upon for advice from your friends and family, that's an important flag that most employer coverage and all exchange coverage will cover those screenings pre-deductible. And there's several other services they cover pre-deductible. Um, I don't know them all by heart, birth control is another one, um, cholesterol screening. So one of the things that we've learned, Cynthia kind of gestured towards it, there's many studies that show people on high deductible health plans are avoiding and delaying all care. They're not, they're not sort of thinking like, do I really need this? And then just avoiding the stuff that maybe they don't really need. It's just across the board that they're skipping things. And so the more people who understand that there are some things that are going to be covered pre-deductible and can advise um, friends and family on that, I think that could really help some people who maybe don't have a choice at their employer of what kind of plan to have. And I'll just give you one statistic from a study that was published in Health Affairs in 2019. And that was that um, low-income women in high-deductible health plans, on average, have a delay of um, 1.6 months to getting breast imaging when their doctor has recommended it. So what that means is a low income woman with an HDHP, it, from the time her doctor says you need this imaging to the time she actually gets it, it's 1.6 months longer than a woman who's not on a high deductible health plan. And then those delays compound. So the low income women on high deductible health plans then don't do their first biopsy until 2.7 months after somebody who was on a different kind of health plan. And then they don't make it to their first chemotherapy until on average 8.7 months after somebody who was not on a high deductible health plan. So this really illustrates the point that, you know, the screening situation um, can really compound the difficulties uh, for somebody on a high deductible health plan. So people understanding that they can do their screenings, they can do their tests and not have that cost sharing is I think could be helpful to uh, people getting, uh, having the advantages of early detection. Uh, I know that then if they get a diagnosis, then they will have to navigate that deductible. And that goes back to the earlier conversation about talking about payment plans and other low interest ways, ways where the patient has more rights to uh, get past that deductible to where you're in your care, uh, past the point of the deductible. So I talked really fast about that. Um, I will pause for a second, just look at my notes and see if there's anything else I wanted to tell you. I think that the advice that Colette is about to give on um, how to make these choices, what the impacts really are on patients is gonna be really helpful. I will say this, um, you know, you heard my biography that I have several years experiences with employer sponsored insurance. Um, employers do care about how features of their plan are impacting their enrollees. So they definitely care about the costs and the premium costs like Cynthia said. But to the extent you feel comfortable sharing your story with how the plan that was made available to you affected you or um, treatment or access to medication for your loved one, um, your HR benefits team's understanding those impacts could make a difference. I'm not guaranteeing it makes a difference, but it could make a difference. They don't, um, they don't know what that looks like in day-to-day -day life when you try to use the coverage, when you, when you have a serious condition, unless someone tells them. Um, Okay, I see a question in the chat. I will answer it before we pivot. I know we have more Q&A at the end, but we'll just do this one real quick. Um, oh yeah, it's about the colonoscopies. Yes, there's parameters on the full coverage. This is absolutely accurate, what Lisa's saying in the, um, in the chat. And then I will also say that there are also some complications with how it gets billed. And so it's not unusual for people who do get a, a colonoscopy within the coverage guidelines to then get a bill like it was a treatment colonoscopy. Over the last few years, the regulators have, have issued several clarifications about the expectations for $0 coverage for a screening colonoscopy, no matter what they find. So for people who do get a bill after that, they have, you know, it's uh, worth the time to follow up and appeal if necessary. But Lisa's absolutely correct about what she said in the chat. And the same is true for the, uh, the breast cancer screenings. There's parameters on it. Um, I think family history does come into play, but it's not a guarantee that everybody in your family would definitely have that coverage for a mammogram. So that's, that's absolutely correct. I will also say about um, you know, what can be pre-deductible or what's required to be pre-deductible. Those parameters are set through regulatory processes and then through legislation. So 
I would say all of that is fair game. To the extent that folks feel like a parameter uh, does not achieve the public health goals that the Affordable Care Act was intended to achieve, um, talking to your representatives or senators or working with the groups you work with on talking to the regulators about um, how different parameters impact patients and whether those parameters should be framed differently, that's that's fair game. So, all right. I will I will pass the mic over to Colette now. I know we're gonna have time for Q&A at the end and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about questions you might have for me specifically. Thank you, Myra. That was very, very, very helpful information. Appreciate it. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Colette Koulianos, Vice President of Payer Relations at the National Hemophilia Foundation. Colette is responsible for developing and overseeing all of NHF's healthcare payer education strategies, policies, programs, and standards, which include identifying and raising subsequent awareness campaigns to address any health plan provisions that have the potential to threaten patient access. It also provides project leadership and oversight of the Comprehensive Care Sustainability Collaborative, which uh, with the mission to develop and execute ongoing strategies to elevate visibility of the integrated comprehensive model of care as the gold standard for optimizing bleeding and clotting disorder patient outcomes at the lowest total cost of care. Thanks for joining us today, Colette. Thank you. And let me share my screen. Thank you for your patience. Of course, now that I say that, the screen isn't going to pop up. I'll do it this way. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So um, thank you for uh, inviting me, Kim, and for that introduction. And um, I want to say thank you to Myra and Cynthia for great information um, that you presented. So I'm looking at high deductible health plans, specifically going to focus on the impact to chronic disease patients. Um, you know, hemophilia impacts a very small number of people con compared to cancer. Um, you know, there's about 30,000 folks in the country that have hemophilia. Uh, compared to, you know, probably, I don't even know the stats, that many are diagnosed in a couple of months with cancer. So uh, obviously, um, you know, we have a very small number of people, but our cost for our patient community is extremely high. So we're a disproportionate share cost driver. So what we do is we try to work with our patient community when it comes to these high deductible health plans or any of these uh, health plan strategies to um, to help lower their burden, right? Because as you've heard from uh, the previous two uh, folks, that that is a strategy for a health plan to try to share risk. If the patient has more skin in the game, the patient's going to um, be more uh, conscientious when they choose uh, the healthcare service. I don't necessarily disagree with that um, in theory, right? But the problem with chronic disease patients, at least in our community, is they live with their disease, hemophilia, cradle to grave. So it's something that's going to be every single year, year after year, they're gonna hit their out-of-pocket max every single year. You know, for the rest of us that are otherwise healthy, myself included, I've only ever hit my out-of-pocket max three times, and they were my three children. Um, so, so here you have, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people living with chronic conditions. And yet at a core, fundamentally, we have as a, a country, most people struggle with healthcare literacy, just having a basic understanding of terms such as premium, deductible, out-of-pocket or co-pays, um, co-insurance, and then what the max out-of-pocket is. And, you know, United Healthcare will do a survey and they say, you know, the actual, the number's gone down. It was 7% of folks in the U.S. have a basic understanding of these four terms. And it's critical because even my own daughter thought her premium should have counted to her max out of pocket. You know, and I, I talk to her about this stuff all the time, but this is, this is the fundamental issue, right? So we don't have a basic understanding of healthcare literacy. And so now you expect us to pick plans or to make decisions um, when we don't have this fundamental understanding. People have, they don't have a knowledge related to what each type of plan means. What's a PPO versus a POS or an HMO or high deductible health plan or an EPO? What does it mean to them? It may not surprise you that the number one consideration when people look for health plan, 
a, a health plan is cost, right? Now, that's assuming they have choice. So I want to preface this by saying, if we look at the um, uh, the payer mix in our country, and our, now we're talking about commercially insured for a moment. If we look at the commercially insured, those folks on private insurance, there are approximately, at least before COVID, 68% of folks on private insurance were in a self-funded health plan. And so we know that before 2018, self-funded health plans, 39% only offered high deductible health plans. So for many people, it wasn't a choice. It's either a high deductible health plan or a high deductible health plan, or maybe a third high deductible health plan. And they might have one deductible be 1,500, the next 4,000, the next 7,000. They had choices, but they're gonna be looking for cost, the premium cost, right? What's it gonna cost them out of pocket? They don't understand that the higher the premium, the lower the out-of-pocket. And the inverse is true, that the lower the premium, the higher are the out-of-pocket. So when we look at out-of-pocket costs, we know that, and, and talking about deductibles, just in general, 80% or over 80% of all plans have a deductible, right? High deductible health plans defined by the IRS as any plan with $1,400 or more as the deductible. And so for a family, that's 2,800. That would be, as long as the plan had 1,400 or more, that's considered a high deductible health plan. It can go all the way up to $8,700 this year. Now that's if it's not paired with an HSA. If it is with an HSA, it's 7,000. But that deductible can be all the way up to that amount of money. And remember that if your plan has a deductible, you must pay the deductible in the entirety before the plan pays the first penny. And people don't understand that. So they go for the lowest cost premium and then they get hit with, with a deductible that could be all the way up to, to $8,700. And they have to pay that full amount before the plan will start kicking in its first penny. So, um, you know, data, and I, there's different data out there, but the, you know, data talks 51% of the US workforce enrolled in a high deductible health plan in 2021. We did a patient survey that we did along with uh, the cancer support community uh, arthritis Foundation, Autoimmune um, Foundation, and Kidney Fund. And 55% of patients with a chronic condition surveyed said they were on a high deductible health plan. In 2020, a study conducted by eHealth was reported the average deductible for individual coverage was 4,364. And as you can see here, 8,439 for family. Now this is in the marketplace. Um, and, and as you also heard Cynthia mentioned that you know, there's much less folks in the marketplace than there are on, on employer-sponsored plans. So, but it's important to understand that these deductibles are absolutely impossible for most people. Um, so, and, and what do I mean by that? Well, the dollars and cents don't add up. So median household income in the U.S. In 2019, it actually was 69560 When the pandemic hit, it actually went down. And it was statistically significant um, decrease at 67,521. And as you also heard, costs are going up, cost shifting is going up. And yet in this case, the median household income is not only not kept up at the same rate, but it's actually gone down. And then we look at the, the out-of-pocket costs and people have house, kids, car, school, clothes. They have all these burdens uh, on, their, on their income. And, and premiums, house insurance, car insurance, and then health insurance. And now we're talking about out-of-pocket costs. There's nothing left to meet those kinds of thousands of dollars. And as I mentioned, year after year after year. And we also heard about the high, you know, the HSA. Yes, there's an opportunity to contribute to an HSA for some people, although few people who have an HSA actually contribute, you heard that. But there's many high deductible health plans that don't have an HSA paired with them. And so, but if you did have an HSA, the max you can contribute is almost half of what the actual max out of pocket could be in the year. So the most you can contribute, let's say is $3,700 when we have a, a, an, a, a potential to have 8,700 for an individual max out of pocket, you'd never be able to even get that much into your account and you can't use it before the money is saved. Unlike a section 125 or cafeteria plan, you have to have the money in your HSA before you can use it. And for patients with a chronic high cost condition who have a high deductible health plan, and you have to pay the full deductible before the plan kicks in, you're gonna be hit with those costs right at the beginning of the year, year after year before your HSA is even funded. So that's another challenge that's presented. 
Now we look at, and the last thing I want to raise about the high-deductible health plans is pairing them with copay accumulator adjustment programs, right? We know copay accumulator adjustment programs have proliferated over the last year, and, and but let me talk about what are they for those of you who may not be aware. It's a change in how the health insurers, uh, it's a policy change. So before 2017, before we ever saw a copay accumulator adjustment program, if a patient in one of these scenarios we're talking about who had a chronic condition, who had a high deductible uh, health plan, who needed assistance to help pay that deductible or their out-of-pocket responsibilities, they could use assistance, whether it was from the manufacturer assistance program, they could use it from a charitable nonprofit program, and that assistance would count towards the member's accumulator, which is their accumulated out-of-pocket spend. That's your deductible, copay, co-insurance. However, when these were implemented, if the company, or if the health plan implemented a copay accumulator adjustment program, they said, you can use assistance, but it no longer will count to the members out of pocket. So therefore, once the member uses the assistance and, and caps it out for the year, because tie that with a high deductible health plan, you will max out your copay assistance within the first few months, at least in the hemophilia community, that assistance will be gone in the first few months. Then the patient is exposed to that full deductible again before they will dispense their medications. So first accumulator rolls out in the beginning of 2017, and then today, we know that approximately 83% of commercial enrollees are in plans that have copay accumulator maximizer language. And so this is where the payer takes that assistance but doesn't uh, account that towards the members out of pocket. I'm giving credit for this Wordle to Adam Fine. Um, so if any of you are into Wordle, I thought this was brilliant. So I want to just real quick go over a, a case study. It was in the very first year the copay accumulators were implemented, and our one of our patients in our community on a high deductible health plan. He had hemophilia. He was a mild patient. He only used clotting factor on demand because he was mild. He wasn't using it prophylactically. Um, he had maxed out his uh, manufacturer copay assistance the first two months of the year. July comes and he uh, develops a bleed, so he needs more medicine. He calls the PBM, the pharmacy tells him that he has a $6,500 deductible. How will he be paying that? He has no way to pay that. Um, he notifies us, we get involved. It took me 40 days working back and forth between the PBM and the health plan to try to get this resolved. At the point of resolution, the pa by then the patient had developed two target joints, which in our world means that he's been bleeding into the joints, causing permanent debilitating pain. And he gets admitted to the hospital, has a couple surgeries. And now as a result of these target joints, they have to do two high dose infusions a day to try to eradicate these target joints. And so um, let's look at what this costs the plan. So the unintended consequence to the patient is the patient goes from being a perfectly, you know, um, active 23 year old just out of college to 25 and a half year old in a wheelchair and um, he can walk but he it's, it's very painful so he's in a wheelchair more than that and two years before the copay accumulator was implemented the plan or two and a half years the plan spent a total of eighty some thousand dollars for two and a half years and all of his health care costs medicine and all of his um, total health care costs for the two years after the copay accumulator, the plan was at three million dollars and counting, three and a half million dollars and counting. So that's the implication to patients and to payers alike. And so um, that's what we're out trying to um, educate folks about. And so I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you. Great, thank you, Colette. I do have something in the chat um, that somebody shared. And perhaps you can answer it. And um, if the others need to join in other um, speakers, please feel free to do so. Um, can you speak to whether there is data on if the shift to employers offering high deductible plans alongside traditional plans is what is contributing to increases in traditional plan premiums? Um, and they say um, that they worry that all the quote healthy employees will enroll in high deductible plans. Um, and then only chronically ill employees will enroll in traditional premium based plans. Can you speak to that or um, invite any of them? I don't know if anybody else has any specific data on that. I mean, I could theoretically, when I talk to folks, you know, I do think there's a time and a place where a high deductible health plan may make sense. The notion of being able to put money in an HSA 
and accrue it year over year and it's pre-tax and that at some point down the road when I retire, I can take that money out and spend it on anything I want without ever having paid tax on it is sounds like a great um, uh, thought. And also if I were to die, I could bequeath it to my children and they would be able to use it for whatever they want and it was never taxed. So the, the concept is good. We just don't recommend it for, for patients in our community, um, especially those who have any potential financial uh, challenges. But I don't know as far as whether or not that's gonna have any impact um, to which plan or the other, because they're still run by, you know, companies offer, again, when we're talking about whether it's a self-funded plan versus a fully funded um, and who has the burden of that. But, Cynthia or Myra, I don't know if you have data on that. Yeah, I don't have data, Colette, but I think I have some thoughts. Um, first, I would say I think the idea that seeing er enrollment in um, a, tra a more traditional health plan erode, I think your instinct that that might cause an employer to veer towards more towards high deductible plans or give them the justification to eliminate the traditional plan, I think that that is um, a reasonable thing to think about. I would also flag that. You know, we talk about like if you're totally healthy, that this you could you know put money away without taxes, maybe give it to your kids. But the one of the things in our healthcare system that I think we need to change the way we think about is we talk about healthy people and people who need healthcare like they're two different groups and they stay that way forever. And you know, everybody um, who gets a cancer diagnosis didn't have a cancer diagnosis the day before the diagnosis. Everybody who gets an MS diagnosis didn't have a diagnosis the day before the diagnosis. So when we're selecting coverage for the year and we're thinking about our own risk tolerance, I think it's important to remember that because we're, you know, we're healthy on open enrollment day does not necessarily mean that for that whole next year, you know, hopefully we will be, hopefully we'll be lucky and, and um, not suddenly become the person who's definitely going to meet their maximum out of pocket, but that could happen to anyone. So I think that's something to remember when we talk about sort of like health people, healthy people are people who need care. That line is, is blurrier than the way we talk about it. I would just add, I think that what the question is getting at kind of is also this idea of adverse selection and a lot of um, a lot of people in employer plans are really their employer is also their insurer. Um, so their employer is a self-funded plan. And so I think the concept of adverse selection doesn't really apply as much in this particular scenario that you're describing. I think that um, it, it probably doesn't matter as much to their employer, like which enrollees are in which plan, what matters most to the employer is how much their total costs are. Um, but uh, I think to Mara's point, it, it does matter if employers see more and more people are, are choosing that high deductible plan, then they might have less of an incentive to continue offering um, you know, higher premium plans that have broader networks or lower deductibles, which might be more appropriate for sicker or chronic. Um, chronic disease patients. And I might take a step back just for folks on what a self-insured plan is. I wouldn't assume everybody on the call would understand that. The short explanation is a self-insured plan, the claims that hit that employer hit their bottom line. And so, I'm sorry, my dog's barking in his sleep. Um, the claims hit the employer's bottom line as opposed to what we call a fully insured plan, which is where um, the insurance company is the one who pays the claims. So what Cynthia is saying here is that if your employer is paying the claim for when you break your leg, it doesn't necessarily matter which, which plan you chose. That deductible money keeps them from paying a little bit longer until you get past the $2,000, but they're going to pay the rest of your bills anyway, no matter which plan you selected. So the front end that you choose from is a little bit less meaningful to the, the employer's actual costs mm -hmm. um, if they are self-insured. And Cynthia might know off the top of her head this statistic, um, for, employ for big companies over like 1,000 employees, most of them are self-insured, right, Cynthia? Yeah, that's right. Um, for, for companies overall, including states that are like government employers, um, I think about 60% of people with employer-based coverage are in a self-funded plan, but if you're in a large company, then the vast majority of large companies are self-funded. Mm -hmm. And I would also add that um, we have seen a shift, you know, in before I would even say before ACA, 
where we saw the biggest um, you know, uptake of, of self-funding was in those large companies, right? So it was a thousand or more, and then it went to 500. We've seen companies as small as 87 employees that have implemented a high deductible or um, uh, self-funded or partially funded. And the reason for that, I and, and this is my humble opinion, is that they don't have to follow the same rules of the ACA um, and they have a lot more latitude on what they're going to cover, what they're not going to. They don't have to cover essential health benefits. Um, they can. I mean, there's, there are. It's a really risky, slippery slope to see what's happening uh, as far as self-funding goes. So there is something in the chat, and it really was getting to what Colette, you were just speaking of, and I don't know if we want to kind of flesh that out a little bit more. Um, is what would be the incentive for employers wanting to go self-funded? Um, and you, again, you just addressed, uh, addressed a potential reason there, and I don't know if uh, there's well, additional I mean, reasons or. Yeah. Well, a beginning though, if you looked at a company and they're saying, you know, they have an actuary do the numbers and they say, this is how much you need to put aside to be able to fund your, you know, this many employees. And they do, you know, I'm sure some statistical analysis and say the most people likely that you would ever have hit you know, X dollars is this. So they set some sort of cap of what they're willing to be exposed to, and that's their deductible. And then they will get stop loss insurance or umbrella coverage, reinsurance. Um, now, some large companies don't do that. They'll just take the full gamble, but mostly there's some stop loss coverage with it. And so they don't expose themselves to the full amount. But again, it allows them to be able to circumvent some of these rules of the ACA you know, when I push back with the ACE, you know, how can they, because a lot of these plans are actually discriminatory. Like we saw a patient in, and Kim's heard this, in December, whose plan not only said they'll no longer cover specialty drugs, which we saw a lot of that, unfortunately, but their plan went so far as to say, we'll no longer provide health coverage for patients with spina bifida, cystic fibrosis, or hemophilia. Now, to me, that seems a violation of, you know, the anti-discrimination section 1557 of the ACA, but when I talk to CMS CSIO, they're like, well, the difference is though, these companies are not a health plan. So they're not violating, you know, once they become self-funded, they're not a health plan. Uh, so, and it, it allows them to, um, to kind of get away with a lot of things that, that otherwise they wouldn't be able to. Okay, there's a, a question um, in the Q&A box. Uh, if one of the major aims of high deductible health plans is to discourage unnecessary overuse of healthcare resources, apart from the practical information that Myra um, and Colette shared, are there guardrails or exceptions that could be put in place to ensure people who require care and treatment can afford it before reaching the deductible? That's a, that's a really good question. So. They, that's already happened, not to the degree it would be needed to, you know, protect seriously ill patients, but we talked about the preventive care requirements under the ACA and things like birth control, certain situations where testing is covered pre-deductible. There's no sort of philosophical reason that the same regulators couldn't put more things before the deductible. So there's been efforts to try to get what's described as high value care, more of it before the deductible, you know, medications that save more, um, more money than they cost, those kinds of things. Uh, this is definitely a reasonable policy question and could be taken up um, through some of the pathways that are already in place for preventive care or through legislation to allow more before the deductible on the high deductible health plans. That's definitely a, from a philosophical point of view, that's an option. We've been successful with a few companies, large companies, when we've shown them the unintended consequences, let's say of the copay accumulator with a high deductible health plan, or even just a high deductible health plan unintended consequence, because the patient can't meet that amount. Um, they've moved our drugs to the preventative drug list. And so that's allowed them to have first dollar coverage on those drugs. Um, so there is options, there's opportunity. The question is whether or not um, we could get it regulated so that you know, our drugs, for example, would always be on the preventative drug list um, or any other uh, drugs is a different story. So I did one of the questions in there that I did want to comment about was about financial advocates steering patients to a foundation or copay assistance. Then they um, 
uh, then any charity care can at least resort to put them on a payment plan. I know that when these, for example, copay accumulators first started, the um, the language on the health plans were very specific to um, to manufacture copay assistance. So if you did have some assistance program out there like Pan Foundation or Healthwell Foundation or any of these programs, you could push the patient to one of those. And if they if they qualified, if they met the income eligibility criteria, then that assistance would count to the member's accumulator. The problem is, that, listen, many of these funds are unfunded, number one. And number two, what we've seen a shift in over the last year and a half or two years is plans changing the rules saying no assistance, not for manufacturer assistance. They even mentioned charity assistance um, will count to a member's accumulator. So um, so that you know poses additional challenges um, to, to this conversation. Yeah, and to that to that question that was in the chat around uh, ways for people to pay, I really appreciate the clarification. I think the point that I was trying to make was um, look for other things before the credit card. And I think that you, this group on the call is the, you know, the right group to help people understand all those options. There's also requirements under the Affordable Care Act that hospitals offer uh, sort of forgiveness programs for patients at certain income levels. So, you know, there's definitely multiple options uh, besides credit cards and, you know, patients should be looking to folks like yourselves to understand exactly what those options are. And this goes back, I think, to Colette's point about the literacy, like how do we how do we help patients know that stuff at the beginning, right? If you just had like an emergency event and you're at the hospital and they're like, we need to schedule the surgery in three days, how do we make sure that person knows about all these resources to help them before mm -hmm. they whip out the credit card because they're scared and they mm -hmm. need surgery and they don't know what to do? I think that's an inflection point that I think all mm -hmm. the different stakeholders could help more, um, help people know what their options are. Great, thank you. And we're starting to run out of time, but there's one question I'd like to open up um, to, to all of the speakers. Um, are there changes in plan design? We touched on a little, a little bit, but are there changes in plan design that could be made to meet the needs of people requiring care and treatment while also discouraging unnecessary use of healthcare? Well, since I, all right, go ahead, Cynthia. I was waiting for somebody to unmute, go ahead. I mean, I think that there's a lot of drivers of healthcare costs and so much of the focus is on utilization, which, you know, puts a lot of the onus on patients or enrollees to be the ones to decide what is good or bad healthcare for them to be using or how to find a lower price provider. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of options out there that do not put that onus on the enrollee, you know, like you can use, um, you know, gatekeeping, for example, like primary care doctors refer you to the specialist before you go to the specialist directly is kind of like another option that the plan design can be set around. But then there's also, you know, price regulation or other factors, like the, really the difference between how much the U.S. spends on healthcare and how much other countries spend on healthcare, which is much lower amount, is not how much, uh, is not the amount of healthcare we use, it's not the um, Americans are just going out and using all kinds of healthcare that we don't need. In fact, we have like shorter average hospital stays, fewer doctor's visits than a lot of European countries do, but they spend less on healthcare because they pay doctors less, they pay hospitals less, they pay prescription drug makers less, you know, and so um, to some extent, like putting all of this onus on the enrollee or the patient to decide what care they really need is maybe a distraction from what the real issue here is, which is healthcare prices. Well, and lack of transparency, I'll say, because yeah, there are, you know, we could argue all day long about drug costs, for example, which is a hot button issue, but, and not my job to pimp for manufacturers by any stretch of the imagination, but there is a lot of hidden cost um, that, you know, the middlemen play and that they don't get any of the black eyes for. And I know that, um, you know, for us, the problem is don't put patients in the middle of this of this challenge. And, 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 and I also heard it mentioned that we're looking at focusing on high value. You know, I'm part of the VBID value-based insurance design at University of Michigan. And, you know, they did put a subgroup together that looked at identifying low value, low, low value um, healthcare, um, 
uh, services that they recommended then plans remove. For example, vitamin D testing, like 90 some percent of Americans are vitamin D deficient. So why test for it and spend millions of dollars on testing when just put them on vitamin D? Um, there's many other things that they recommended to remove from the plan. But then focusing on not removing those things that have the high value, which are going to ultimately lower the spend and um, you know achieve optimal outcomes. Well, thank you to everybody. Unfortunately, we are at time. Uh, thank you so much to Cynthia, Myra, and Colette uh, for sharing your expertise today. Um, please um, know that we want to thank our sponsors, uh, Amgen, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, GSK, Janssen, Novartis, Merck, Pfizer, and Sanofi for their generous support of today's very informative roundtable. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees. Please reach out to the Cancer Policy Institute at action at cancersupportcommunity.org if you have any questions. And again, this roundtable is recorded and will be posted on our website for, for further um, ability to, to listen to it again. Thank you so much and appreciate you joining us today. Thank you.